So welcome and thank you all for accepting the invitation to join us today for this FMCSA Clearinghouse webinar. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is David Bell. I'm the CEO of USA Mobile Drug Testing National Headquarters. I work closely with our regional compliance specialists, franchisees that have invited you here to this call today. I've been in this industry for nearly seven years and I work personally with small and large companies all the way up to Fortune 100 in their DOT and non-DOT drug testing programs. I happen to be a certified uh, collector trainer as well as a BAT certified trainer. I've written countless articles over the years published in magazines in regards to drug testing in the workplace and productivity and safety. So many people uh, have asked us leading up to the clearinghouse, like, like, what is it? So basically the clearinghouse is an online database. It's real world, real time. And this is specifically for all FMCSA covered drivers for the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Now, one primary use for the clearinghouse database, for many of you guys that have been in this industry a long time, you know about the guys who want to cheat the system and job from, hop from job to job, right? So basically they're having a violation at work. Maybe they have two employers they're working for and they have a violation and they decide they want to move on to another employer and just not tell the new employer about what had happened. So this is going to prevent that because all of the records are stored by the CDL driver's license number. And so that's going to prevent that from happening. We even have cases where drivers go to another state and they were issued new driver's license numbers because they weren't having clear ways to validate it. This system is tied in directly to those states for validating the CDLs. So that's going to prevent that type of stuff from happening and making sure that the roads stay safe. So the type of information that's being stored here are refusals to test. And there's two types. The refusals that are lab determined, uh, that an MRO uh, would be reporting, and then at collection sites where someone refuses to show up when they're told to go do a, a random test or post-accident, um, and those are reported by the employer. The positive drug and alcohol results will be stored here. If you have direct knowledge of illegal drug or alcohol use on the job or just prior to someone starting their, their day, that's the type of violation that's reported here. And then the SAP process reports at the end of that return to duty uh, process where they've done the follow-up, the SAP will report that completion there. And then you as the employer will be reporting those negative <clears throat> return to duty tests. Now, as of about a week ago, there's been over 400,000 people registered in the clearinghouse with over 6,000 queries being run. So they, you might have seen a message come out anytime in the last uh, couple of weeks right after the clearinghouse started on January the 6th where they sent, said you can hire drivers without running queries. If you are one of those uh, people who hired a driver because you didn't have access to the system, that time period is ended. You have to follow and comply with the entire regulation regarding the clearinghouse. And if you did hire somebody during the period when you didn't have access or you had a violation, all of those need to be reported. And if you have a driver that was hired during the period and they're driving, you need to still run a query electronically as well as the paper one that you're doing. So what's really important to know, and I know a lot of you guys have probably saw, started seeing this already here in December and in January, that on the current versions of the CCS and ATFs, there's not really a space written for the CDL, right? It says employee uh, identification number or social security number. And the direction of the FMCSA and the DOT is, is pretty simple. They want you to write, have your collectors or our collection sites write in the CDL with the state abbreviation at the beginning in that same line, 
right? So, so that's essentially what needs to happen. If you're not doing that, you're going to want to be providing those same numbers, the CDL numbers, in your list to the, to the people running your randoms. If you're in a consortium, we're going to need that information because that's how the violations are reported. So in accordance with the CFR 382.123, the person completing the CCF or ATF must annotate the driver's CDL number and state of issue in Step 1, Section C of the CCF. Step 1B of the ATF for the FMCSA regulated test. If an employer or CTPA does not provide the CDL number and the state of issuance, the collector or alcohol technician should ask the driver for this information at the time of the collection. So even if the CDL number and the state of issue is not listed on the CDF, the collector must send the uh, controlled substance test specimen, right, the drug test itself, to the laboratory. The laboratory will also not hold up the test. They will test it and then are going to go about the process of trying to get that information so if there's a violation it can be reported. Um, so we've definitely seen a lot of that. We've seen some challenges um, where employers don't quite know what to do yet and we're just here trying to clean that up for you guys. Uh, eventually, you do need to get that in compliance and start having that put on the forms during your audits. They're definitely going to want to see it, and the sooner you comply, the easier it is for everybody. So we get the question, so does the clearinghouse rule change any of the DOT drug and alcohol testing rules in the CFR 49 Part 40? And no. Nothing in the drug and alcohol testing regulations in the 49 CFR Part 40 will change as a result of the clearinghouse. So you're still complying with everything. This is an additional uh, requirement to your program. Now, covered drivers include those drivers with a CDL operating on public roads, uh, truck or bus operators with weight uh, that is greater than 26,001 or more pounds, or maybe they're carrying 16 or more passengers, including the driver, or the vehicle of any size that has to have that placard because they're ha transporting hazardous materials. Now, you should, you should know that it is not a requirement that all drivers register for the clearinghouse. If a driver has been working for you for years, has no intention of, of working anywhere else or is not leaving, they may never have to register in the system. So, but we recommend, the DOT also is recommending that you have all drivers register while they're at your office when you're able to help coach them in a more timely fashion because registering is a multi-step process. And if you have a driver out on the road, it can get very complicated if you're trying to register them because they need to give an electronic consent. So the advice is have everybody register up front. It will save you a lot of headache later. One thing to also kind of keep in mind, um, hold on, we have a question here, David. Let's see. Good question, David. So it says, so if I hire a driver and could not get consent through the clearinghouse, I should report this in the clearinghouse. If so, where do I report this in the clearinghouse? Actually, you don't report that in the clearinghouse, David. You're just not allowed to hire the driver. So if they can't give you consent within 24 hours of a full query being run or give you consent period at a pre-employment uh, query, then you can't have the driver on the road and you can't hire them in the pre-employment situation. So that's kind of the ruling on that. Um, there's nowhere to report it, you just can't hire them. Okay, so your, your follow-up question there, David. Um, it does say that it was during the beginning. So you need to go back and run a query now on him and verify there's nothing there. So you probably have done the paper version as you were told to do and were still required to do up until January of 2023. You need to go in now and run the digital query uh, at this point now that the system's available. Good question. Thanks for asking. So we did have questions about 
will pass um, people, if like say someone has a violation, it was in December uh, of 2019. They had a violation, they select, they went to a SAP, they did the return to duty test, and they're in their follow-up process, and they're gonna complete at some point here in the near future the prescribed follow-up testing. So that situation will not get reported, even though the final uh, ending date is past January the 6th, none of that will be stored in the clearinghouse. Um, what would happen is if, he, if the driver, he or she had any violations during the follow-up testing, that new violation would trigger a report in the clearinghouse. So just kind of keep that in mind, nothing before January 6th is being stored, only after. That's why you're required to still do the paper manual checks. Also, uh, no non-DOT records will be stored in the clearinghouse whatsoever. So if there's violation of your company policy, you won't store any records about that. We also got lots of questions about, well, what if I have um, FTA or FAA, some other agency? Um, none of those records are being reported. It's just FMCSA at this point. So who has to register? Employers, drivers, and service agents will be registered, required to register in the clearinghouse. This includes the medical review officers, the substance abuse professionals, the consortium third-party administrators, law enforcement and state driver's license agencies will also register because they're gonna have access to the clearinghouse on the back end. Now, if you haven't registered, you should do so now. Okay, just, just get it done, get caught up, do anything you need to do. You would go directly to the clearinghouse. If you have a DOT uh, portal account, you're gonna go in there, set it up, give yourself the authority to, to sign into the clearinghouse by adding that role. And then it's a single sign in, you're using the same credentials, signing into the clearinghouse. If you're um, not operating with a DOT number, which there's a few that do, you would just go directly get a login.gov and then sign into the clearinghouse like a lot of the MROs and third party administrators had to do. A couple of things to kind of uh, mention for you guys. If as an employer, we get those questions a lot, you are not going in there and finding a list of drivers and then selecting them and adding them to like a roster inside of the clearinghouse you and drivers will not be linked in any way. You're both independent and as an employer, you have the ability to report based on having the proper information and then that's stored under that driver's um, record, okay? So you're not, not linking it, otherwise you would require to have a roster and it'd have to be up to date all the time. And so they just eliminated that feature because it is not a requirement. Also, other employers are like, how do we select our MRO? Well, the MROs have the right to report just like an employer, and it's based upon the information of the driver, the CDL, date of birth, and that type of information. So you are not selecting an MRO, but you are selecting a third-party administrator as a registered uh, agent for you to be able to operate on your behalf inside of your account. So it's the only person potentially you're selecting, and drivers are gonna be selecting their SAP professionals when they have those violations. Parker, you have a question here. Yeah, good question, uh, Parker. So if your drivers are not required to register, um, do I as the employer have to register them? No, so again, um, not all drivers are, are required to register. If they don't ever have a violation in the system, you can get a paper uh, consent form for your annual queries because the, the query is gonna show there's no result for that driver. And as a result, that's, that's all you're, you're doing as, as a limited query. If that driver has a record, then at that point, you're going to have to have them register in order to give electronic consent. So you don't have to register them and you could sit at a computer and register them if they're just not uh, skilled enough. So you're, you're capable of doing that. Yeah, so Parker, you're not registering, uh, he asked the follow-up question, not my drivers, but me, right. So you 
don't register the drivers. If the driver needs your assistance, your employee needs an ass your assistance, you can obviously assist them in registering, but you are not registering any of them in the system. You register you as an employer, and that's it. Good question. So keep in mind that if you run a uh, pre-employment or if you're running just a full query because of uh, something comes back in the system and the driver does not give electronic consent, if that driver is telling you, hey, I do not see the electronic consent that you're talking about. So a couple of things that they've noticed have happened is drivers who have registered early or registered during the time where there were some challenges, um, they were not able to validate their driver's license. Again, as I mentioned, this, this system is linked to all of the state driver's license agencies, and there's a button in there to validate um, the license. So two things could happen. You don't have the right information, so when you ran the query, it didn't show up in their account for them to give consent, or they didn't validate the driver's license and it didn't connect the dots. So you just should then have to rerun the query and so that I can give the electronic consent. So a couple of things there. They also did have still up to about last week when we met with the DOT, they did have, they're still having some challenges in North Carolina um, and they're working through that, probably have that fixed within a couple of weeks um, in Florida and a couple other states where, like North Carolina for instance, um, they require four zeros in the front of the, the license number. Some people are entering it without it and so they're not showing up. And in Florida, there was a dash, which they've solved that already, um, and that's all working out just fine. But there's still a few little bugs, but majority of all the states are validating just fine. All right. <clears throat> so you're going to have someone, and most of you probably registered already, but I want something to keep in mind. You want to have a key employer representative register in the clearinghouse. This is somebody who's going to be the account holder and uh, primary access to the system. Then they're going to allow you know, as many other people in your company to have access for various roles, as well as they're going to assign the third party administrators um, that, that need to do that work. So that initial person is not required to be the DER. It can, it can be, you know, uh, the owner of the company who's maybe not the DER. It could be anybody of importance uh, who plans to be around because that account, obviously, as you imagine, is the primary main source. So just keep that in mind um, so that you can have the roles properly and don't, don't get locked out of your account. I want to talk a little bit about some obligations for you guys as employers. Uh, you're required to query the new drivers running a pre-employment query, and there's two types of queries. So that pre-employment is considered what's called a full query, and then annually you'll run what's called a limited query, and that's going to determine if there's anything present, any records for a driver, and at that point it'll flip over to a full query, require that electronic consent in order to see the records. And as I mentioned before, you still have to run your manual process, get the consent forms, go back to the previous employers and verify the information. And you need to do that for up to three years all the way till January 6, 2023, because they could have a violation, you know, that, that falls in December and you're hiring somebody in 2023 thinking, hey, I'm all set, um, so, you know, or at the end of 2022. So you got to still do that paper query to cover the guidelines of the amount of time you've got to look back and run the digital process, and that'll, that'll cover you. Once that point comes, no longer are you going to be required to do the paper check because you're going to have three years of data in the clearinghouse, and this will be the only way to search. Um, annual queries uh, of all existing drivers that kind of mention that. We recommend you do that uh, with that last roster in the, in, the, in the final quarter that you're running your selection. Um, you, you know, if you're putting all your drivers, if you're running yours every quarter, at that point take that same list, run your query at that point, and then yearly do it at that same time because it's a requirement that you do it every 12 months. Clearly there's not going to be a lot of records in the system now, um, so doing it now doesn't make sense. So they just recommend 
uh, to start later in the year. You're going to be required um, for reporting those alcohol test positives greater than 0.04 or above, um, employer determined refusals to test, and the actual knowledge as defined in the Part 382.107. And that actually states the FMCSA regulation Part 382 provides that an employer may not allow a covered employee to perform safety sensitive functions when the employer has actual knowledge that a driver has engaged in on-duty or pre-duty alcohol use, used alcohol prior to a post-accident testing, or used a controlled substance. An employer may not use a driver under these circumstances until the driver has completed the return to duty process prescribed in the 49 CFR Part 40 Subpart O. The employer may elect to terminate an employment based upon actual knowledge. You're also going to be reporting those negative return to duty tests, right? So that's not going to happen by the MRO. When you, when you have somebody who has a violation, if they're coming back to work for you or maybe they were seeking new employment and you hired them and they just uh, finished their SAP program, that negative return to duty is an employer responsibility to get reported. But keep in mind, when the program uh, end date that was set forth by the SAP, they report the completion of the program. None of the follow-up tests are going to be reported along the way, only if there's a violation after that negative return to duty. Um, one thing that we did here last week, you know, someone asked this question, is that you will see if there's a driver, he's coming to work for you, he's in the middle of the SAP process, a follow-up, he's going to show eligible in the system to drive if he has that negative return to duty test listed. It's your responsibility as an employer, because you're inheriting the, the completion of that program, to make sure you get the paperwork and verify that end date and that he's in compliance and that you're, you're doing what needs to be done. Because you could find yourself, if you're not paying uh, very close attention, uh, there's a small color bar next to the driver's name when you're running their queries. It kind of turns green and red. That's what's signifying, you know, their eligibility. And it's, it's very faint. It's you may, almost not even noticeable if you didn't realize that actually changes color. So um, if you hire someone, they're in a program, you need to be paying attention to that even if it does say that they're eligible to drive um, because you're now going to be responsible. And so you could end up with somebody who's just decided not to complete a program and they've, they've jumped a job and you didn't pay attention. Uh, we just would hate to have that be a, a violation that you just over, overlooked. So that was something that they pointed out last week at the meeting. It's also your responsibility for updating your policies and then educating all of the drivers on what information is going to be reported to the clearinghouse. So you want to make sure that you're getting those updates and letting everybody know. And as you, as you can remember, uh, the DOT doesn't mess around with this stuff. Compliance is not optional. It will cost you. Employers must make the reports. You have a time limit. You have till the third, the close of the third business day uh, following the date in which you have information to report. So it can't sit there for a week. You can't do it two weeks later uh, with the clearinghouse being new. If you've got audits coming up, they're definitely going to be checking on those violations and making sure that they're reported on time. Uh, you wouldn't want to have that also cause you an issue. Canadian and Mexican employers that have drivers, um, they're going to be required if they're operating on, in the U.S. Uh, to report their violations as well. They're not excluded, so they're, they're equally having to report, so just kind of know that. Owner operators. Now, um, this is kind of a unique situation. Just had a weird uh, click on my phone. Can you guys still hear me okay? Anyone just type in the box? Perfect. Thanks, guys. Sorry about that. Just uh, made a funny noise. Thought it might have hung up on us. All right. So unique for the owner operators, and this is this is something that uh, you may not have realized. If you're if it's an independent, you one of you guys here, you're just a small company. It's just you. You have to register. Then you have to select uh, CTPA in order to do all querying and reporting for you. Now, here's where it gets tricky. You have multiple drivers that work for you. 
you're, you are still considered an owner operator and you now have a dual role in the clearinghouse. You have one role as an employer and you have one role as an owner operator because you're driving the truck. You, you, you know, we had someone at the meeting in Atlanta, they're like, well, we have, you know, 30 drivers and the owner is not driving. Well, the question asked by the TOT, well, is, is he driving at all? She's like, well, just to move the vehicles occasionally, but it is on public roadways from one yard to the next. So that guy has to register in the system. If they're, if they're going to get in the truck at all, they have to register. They have to select a CTPA, even if they have 20 or 30 or 100 employees, if they're still driving a truck, they have to have a CTPA do reporting and querying for them. So that's a requirement, and it's a little funny. There's just a section when you're logged in as an employer in this situation right at the top right-hand corner, and you can drop it down and select your role, and it'll have you see different views. So you can do queries and all of the things you need to do or reporting violations as an employer, but then you can also go in as your um, owner-operator side and, and do your selections there for your CTPA. So a little confusing, but that's the way the system works. So all of your drivers, you know, we had a lot of drivers kind of curious and didn't really know what's going on, even still early here at the end of January. The year's just started. It's, it's been less than a month that people have been reporting. Drivers can log in and see what type of information is present. Um, all information is being tracked by the CDL number, the state of issue, um, which is totally replacing the Social Security number or the employee ID, as we mentioned earlier. Drivers will need to provide the consent to release their information in the clearinghouse. So I, I mentioned it a little bit. I just want to make sure we're really clear. If they're, you're running an annual query, we recommend that you just have a consent form that says, I, Mr. Employee, give consent for the life of my employment with XYZ Trucking Company to run queries in the clearinghouse. You save that paper consent form in your system somewhere, you can run those limited queries year after year after year without getting signatures. But obviously at the time of pre-employment, they're giving a digital consent, so that means they have an account if they're changing jobs. If you're running a full query because seven months into this year, your driver has two jobs, he has a violation at the other employer, you don't even know he has a second job, and you run the limited query thinking all's well with John, and then John says, hey, there's, the query says there's information. So now he's got to go and give you that electronic consent. Um, if he doesn't, within 24 hours, no matter where he's at over the road, he's got to get out of that truck your requirement to make sure that they are not driving if they do not give you consent within 24 hours to see the full query to see if they're still eligible to be driving. So that's your responsibility as an employer, so just keep that in mind. So the drivers are the ones that select the SAPs, right? So if, if they have a violation, you give them a list of SAPs to go see, they go into the clearinghouse, they select who their SAP is, and then that SAP process begins. Um, you're going to have some drivers, you know, this is digital age, there's potential that something could be uh, invalid, so drivers may challenge only the accuracy of the information reported. So they're saying, hey, that's not um, a record that belongs to me. That's the type of information they can, they can challenge. If it's an accurate report for them, but it's a not, you know, it says it's a positive test, they can't at all um, challenge the accuracy of the test. It's just the accuracy of whether that information was a different, you know, David Bell. But ideally, that's not going to happen. There's lots of data points besides the CDL, the date of birth, you know, uh, lots of things to match up. So it's going to be pretty rare, but you know, by all means, it is possible that that information uh, could get mixed up. But that's how that goes. It's a 45-day process for that driver on very, very limited situations with a request. The FMCSA could have it uh, expedited, but that expedition the time is still about 14 days. So 45 days for a standard dispute, 14 days for an expedited, and they have to determine whether they're going to grant that or not. So, you know, don't, don't expect a whole lot there. 
Jennifer, I will uh, follow up with you after the call about resources for substance abuse professionals, okay? Thanks for the question. So you as the employer, um, you're required to buy the query plan. It's a separate account in uh, the clearinghouse. You have to buy it. So let's say you buy 100 credits. Uh, if we're the TPA, we're going to go into your account. You give us a list of 50 drivers to run your annual query, and we're going to run it. If for some reason you only have 25 credits in there, we're going to be unable to run that uh, selection of 50 people we're not going to have enough credit. So that's your responsibility. You have to go in and pay for those things. Um, the only other responsibility monetarily is usually having a membership to someone like a USA Mobile Drug Testing who's going to be doing this additional work for you in the system so that you have a, an agreement and then whatever those additional fees. But the, the, the clearinghouse has a dollar twenty-five for a, a search. So pre-employment's a buck twenty-five on an annual query. Um, let me go back to pre-employment. So if you run a pre-employment on ten people because you're hiring individuals and they never give consent, if you're not going to hire them, you can delete that request and you'll get credit of the dollar twenty-five. That question came up last week. That's how they answered the question. Um, so the credit will come back to your account um, on the yearly limited queries that you're running, if something shows up and says, hey, we need this, there's a record here, you need to run a full query, the same $1.25 covers it when it converts. So it's not going to take an additional $1.25 to run a separate query if it now is a full query. So, you know, they're trying to be respectful of that. So the MRO is required to report to the clearinghouse any positive drug, uh, DOT drug test result, and any MRO determined refusals to test. Those are the refusals to test include test results reported as a substituted or adulterated specimen indicated, you know, potential cheating on the test, right? Something like that that's determined by the laboratory. That would then be reported by the MRO. The MRO has two business days. You as the employer had by the close of business on the third day, MROs have two business days to report to the clearinghouse once they have a final result and verified the reports. So any of those non-negatives that, um, that are shipped into the lab and then run through the process and then it's validated and the MRO determines it to be a valid positive. So that's going to be reported. MROs also have a responsibility if there's any thing that's previously been um, reported to the clearinghouse, that change has to be reported within one business day. Um, so if something's overruled from a negative to a positive um, or vice versa, it, they only have one day to get it, get it updated, so it can't sit. Um, unfortunately, right now there is no API, so there's no digital connection between all the MROs in the country and the millions of tests being done. So all of these things are manual process. It's they're having to log in, select the driver one at a time. They're not able to link their systems and have it, you know, report. So that's, that does cause some delays, but, you know, all the MROs are keeping up with it. Ours are keeping up with the process. MROs have a responsibility, um, again, to keep that one business day. It, it, it's critical, and, and as you can imagine, if something's overruled in, 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 to the driver's favor, they're not wanting them to sit on it for multiple days. Um, the information the MRO is required to report to the clearinghouse, they're entering the information as this, right? It's the date of the test, um, that was verified result, the reason for the test, along with the actual test result. In the case of an adulterated specimen, the adulterated substance and the reason for determining that adulteration, the federal chain number, right, so the CCS number, specimen ID, the driver's name, the commercial driver's license number, the state of issuance, and the date of birth, the employer's name, the address, and the USDOT number, if it's applicable, because not all employers that have these people have a DOT number. DOT specimen collectors are not registering in the clearinghouse, so there's no requirement for them to have an account. They're not linked to anybody. Uh, they're just in the field uh, doing the testing. 
also had lots of concerns, right? Anything that's uh, being stored by any agency, whether it's government or otherwise, there's data security concerns. Well, the site's built following the federal security standards, so it's very secure. Um, the information is not public. You're not going to see anyone running a Google search and finding the driver's name and then, hey, here's this violation of record. Um, it's just not going to happen that way. This is a completely closed system. Um, and then for those drivers that are kind of leery about technology, um, they have to give consent to have the full record shown. So if they're just, you know, if they decide they don't want to ever give consent and go get a job in a different, you know, line of work, that's their prerogative. But they have to give consent in order for the full record to be given out anyways. Um, and then again, as, as you may know or may not know, HIPAA, you know, there's no HIPAA compliancy in the drug testing industry. It's unrelated to healthcare. So there, HIPAA doesn't follow this type of security. The federal security standards are greater than the HIPAA security standards anyways. So USA Mobile Drug Testing, um, we're already reporting to the clearinghouse. We can, we're providing tons of guidance to our employers. Um, we're already helping people run those pre-employment queries, um, reporting some of those alcohol violations that are happening right now. Um, we're working with owner operators across the country. So, and our MRO services, as I mentioned, they're already reporting those violations. So all of this is already working. Laboratories are all in compliance. You know, the DOT has been talking about it for a long time. They gave all of us a little bit of early access. Um, and, you know, as of January 6th, we started testing and doing the things we needed to do to make sure we're all set. So all of that is currently happening and we're helping you with that. So the DER, um, you are responsible for all of those refusals occurring at collection sites, right? So the DER relies on the documentation of from a collector. You know, many times we, we see this all over the country where someone's refused to test or you send someone down to a site because you're not having a collector come to your company and you sent them for a random, they just didn't show up, right? And, and, and if you had already told that collection site that somebody's coming to do a random, let me know whether they, they show up or not, and you find out a day or two later that there was no, nobody showed up. So collectors, when there's refusals to test at those sites, they have to make sure that they document thoroughly. Um, and get that information to you because as the DER, you have to make that determination on that refusal to test. Then you have to report those refusals and it requires you having the documentation uh, in order to submit everything. Uh, and the clearinghouse is pretty clear on what this is. The documentation including, but is not limited to, electronic mail or other contemporaneous records. Um, one of the time and date of the driver when they were notified to appear for the testing site, and the date, time, and the testing site location in which the employee was directed to appear, or an affidavit providing evidence of such notification. Then you've got a certificate of service or other evidence showing that the employer provided the employee with all of the same documentation reported for the refusal, and then in the case of uh, refusals based on the donor or the applicant admitting to the specimen collector that they've attempted to adulterate or substitute the specimen, employers may report those type of violations um, only, right? So these are the ones that you have to do. This is your responsibility as an employer. Uh, this not being done by the MRO. Um, so just keep that in mind. I'd like to just go over a couple of uh, situations real quick before we end the presentation on, on the refusal to test uh, situations at point of collections. So again, they fail to appear for the urine collection when directed to report, when the collection site is aware of a scheduled collection and notifies an employer of the no-show. We even had that happen recently at one of our locations and uh, it was a post-accident type test. The donor uh, communicated with the collector, 
they were meeting at a gas station within five minutes that was nearby. The collector was already on site. Driver said, great, I'll be there. A few minutes later, the driver calls and says, I have an emergency at home. I got to go. Um, and, you know, so clearly that's, that's a violation and a refusal to test and the documentation and the DER needs to make sure that that was reported. Failure to remain at a urine collection site. So if they decide they want to leave in the middle of a test, uh, once they've reported and it started, uh, failing to provide a urine specimen. So again, they're just not complying uh, with the process. Failing to permit a monitored or observed collection in the event that it's required or a collector determines that there's something going on with the specimen, maybe they think it's substituted, um, you know, they, they find that determination, then they require this observation. Failure or decline to take an additional drug test um, that the employer or collector has directed. Failure to cooperate with any part of that collection process. Um, you know, don't not emptying their pockets or washing their hands. And these are requirements that the, the regulation says to do so. So educating the drivers on what to exactly expect, especially new drivers, just, just saves all of that frustration. Um, for observed collections, they're failing to follow those instructions by raising and lowering their clothing uh, so that we can verify what's going on. If they're found to be wearing prosthetic or other devices to trying to, to, to carry in fake urine or substitute specimen, if they admit to the collector that they have adulterated or substituted the specimen, failing to appear at the alcohol test, so similar to the, to the urine, but, uh, you know, it only really works as if you're communicating with the collection site that they're, they're in route. Um, if they fail to remain at the alcohol testing site for any reason, they decide to leave, or if they cannot provide adequate amount of breath or saliva in the middle of a test, and uh, they, they don't go and, and have that verified that is a, is a medical situation for them. So they have an opportunity to go get that done. If they refuse to do it, that's a refusal to test. So these are just a few of the things that you guys got to keep in mind and communicate with your collection sites and collection companies and TPAs uh, to make sure that those things are happening. So I think I answered most of the questions we had as we were going today. Um, if at all you guys come up with questions, obviously the people you're working with out in the field, um, no matter which one of our people they are, they're, they're really great, they're really educated, and they definitely can help get you guys back on track and answer those questions for you. Um, so feel free to reach out to us at any time. We'll be glad to help. We'll also email you these slides for review. Um, Within a day or so, you should have them tomorrow. We'll get these slides emailed out to everybody who's participated. Uh, we appreciate your time. Have a great day.